Welcome everyone to World Affairs Fridays, brought to you by the Peoria Area World Affairs Council and Bradley University, our generous hosts. Today, we are delighted to hear from Frankie Stern. He is a local boy who is a Foreign Service Officer with the U.S. Department of State. Mr. Sturm has um, been with the Department of State since August of 2010. He is currently an Economic Officer. I'm sorry, I think you just said you finished. He just ended this post as the Economic Officer at the U.S. Embassy in Param Paramaribo, Suriname. I'm sure I just screwed that. Um, he previously was a press officer in the Office of Press Relations from 2016 to 2018, Vice Counsel at the U.S. Embassy in Guatemala City, Guatemala, 2014 to 2016, and Deputy Cultural Attaché at the U.S. Embassy in Warsaw, Poland, 2011 to 2013. Um, he is also, um, or before going to Poland, he was the Truman National Security Project communications director. He's got a great deal of interesting and um, diverse experience in the State Department. And again, he's a local boy, so he has his master's in international relations from the University of Chicago and a master's in international, I'm sorry, in his bachelor in history from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Welcome, Mr. Sturm, and take us away. All right, Angela. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm really glad that I'm able to do this presentation today. I was able to do a similar one about five years ago. Uh, that one was in person, so we're a little bit different circumstances now than we were back then. But I'm really glad that everybody is here to participate. Uh, and I'm going to give a short presentation, 20 or so minutes, and then happy to jump into Q&A because I think Q&A is a lot more interesting than me just talking at you. So again, thank you for being here and I'll, I'll jump right in. So um, let's see if I can get the screen sharing. There we go. Okay. So I figured I would start out with where I've served. Um, my first tour was in Warsaw, Poland. I was the deputy cultural attache. So I worked a lot on speaker programs and exchange programs and public events during that tour. After that, I went to Guatemala City, Guatemala, where I was a vice consul. So a vice consul, I was doing visa applications, passport applications, helping American citizens. That's something that all foreign service officers who are generalists have to do during one of their first two tours. I'll get into what it means to be a generalist later on in the presentation, um, but that was where I did my consular tour in Guatemala. And then after that, I moved on to Washington, DC to serve as a press officer. And of course you might think, Diplomats are supposed to be spending their time overseas in other countries representing the United States and their home country. And of course, that's true. And that's where we spend most of our time. But policy is made in Washington. Uh, and the real decision makers are in Washington. And so to really understand how the department works, how the building works, as we tend to say, you have to serve in DC to see how the sausage is made. And if you want to be a truly effective officer at the kind of mid and higher levels, it's very important to serve there. So I served there as a press officer working under uh, for the spokesperson of the State Department. So helping out during the daily press briefing, answering questions from journalists, putting out transcriptions of speeches and comments from the secretary, putting out physically putting out press releases and things like that. And it was also during that time that I experienced my first presidential transition, which was it was the first year, excuse me, the last year of the Obama administration transitioning to the first year of the Trump administration. Um, and this is something we can get into later if it's of interest, uh, a, a transition from one administration to another. Most, many if not most things in foreign affairs don't change radically from one administration to the other, even if they're of different political parties. There are some big ticket items that certainly do change uh, and some things that certainly do change. Um, a lot of them stay the same, but uh, there was a very big change in the way the press office worked during my experience in Washington. I'm, I'm happy to go into that uh, later if it, people are interested. After my tour in Washington, I went to Paramaribo, Suriname, where I was the deputy political economic chief. So that was a lot of reporting on economic issues, political issues, looking for commercial opportunities for these businesses. And that was a fascinating experience because Suriname is not a country a lot of people are familiar with. I was not familiar with it when I initially got the assignment. It's a small country in South America, former Dutch colony, Dutch speaking. But during the second half of my assignment there, they elected a new president that wanted to have a deeper relationship with the United States. So we're in, a, we're in a situation of kind of rebuilding and deepening our relationship with the country, which is, you know, you join the foreign service for a moment like that to kind of rebuild and deepen a relationship with another country. And so that was a tremendous tour that I really enjoyed. 
And then I am now on home leave, having finished my tour in Suriname, and I'll be heading off to Hyderabad, India in July to be the Assistant Public Affairs Officer, where I'll be focusing on media relations and working with the press. So that's enough about me. Uh, let's get into the Department of State. So we have a nice picture here of Thomas Jefferson, better known for the Declaration of Independence, better known for being uh, the President of the United States, third President of the United States, but he was also our first Secretary of State. And below him, we have a picture of Anthony Blinken, who is our current Secretary of State. Now, you can find what the State Department does at any number of websites and any number of sources, but like many organizations, we actually have a mission statement. So I think it's worthwhile just reading from this official mission statement. On behalf, whoop, sorry, my computer just kicked me off of my presentation. Let me get it back. There we go. On behalf of the American people, we promote and demonstrate democratic values and advance a free, peaceful, and prosperous world. The U.S. Department of State leads America's foreign policy through diplomacy, advocacy, and assistance by advancing the interests of the American people, their safety, and economic prosperity. And that mission statement is from the Department of State and USAID Joint Strategic Plan from fiscal year 2018 to 2022. And you might notice in the dates there that spans administrations of different political parties and different presidential administrations, which underscores the notion that as the Department of State, we actually, we are an executive branch, so we're under the executive, we're under the president, but we don't work for a president, we don't work for a party. We actually, as foreign service officers, take an oath to the constitution. Um, but the fact that our budgetary cycles and our, do not fall neatly to presidential administrations, it really goes to underscore the point that we are an apolitical body. We're supposed to be an apolitical body carrying out the, the wants and desires of the executive, which is something that I think is worth underscoring. Now, some State Department basics. I want to see here if we can, oh, okay, it's all popped up here. It's harder to do interactive uh, via Zoom. I like, these are very easy to do interactive in person, but we'll just go with it. So we have 270 missions in 180 countries. There's approximately 200 countries in the world. So we've got a mission in almost every country. Now you see 180 countries, 270 missions, what the heck is going on with that? So we have embassies in most countries, but in some countries like Mexico, we have a lot of consulates. We have our embassy in Mexico City, as well as 10 or 11 consulates throughout Mexico because there are so many Americans in Mexico and we have such a deep relationship with Mexico. So with a lot of countries that have the embassy as well as consulates in other cities. And then we have missions to uh, international organizations, UN organizations based in Europe and Africa and other parts of the world. So all in all, about 270 missions around the world. We've got 76,000 total employees in the Department of State. And one thing that's very interesting about that is 50,000 of them are foreign nationals. They are not American citizens. The vast majority of people who work for the Department of State work in embassies and consulates in their home countries, in U.S. embassies and consulates in their home countries. The idea behind that is they have institutional memory and they have a local knowledge that an officer cannot replicate. Um, there's just no way that a U.S. diplomat can be a, an expert on every country in the world. And there's no way, no one knows a country quite like the people from it. And so we have local staffers that have a deep pool of knowledge about the countries that they are from. And they also have institutional memory, which is really important because our tours overseas are two or three years, occasionally four. And so I leave, my successor arrives, and he or she has to kind of learn from scratch to a certain extent. And so the local staffers who are the institutional memory, they do a lot of that bridging the gap as new officers come in and new officers come out. Of course, it is very important to emphasize that it is the officers that are the decision makers, particularly the ambassador, the chief of mission. Um, but the vast majority of employees, if you walk into a U.S. consulate or embassy overseas, are going to be foreign nationals. They are, in a lot of ways, they are a backbone of what we do overseas. And lastly, we are approximately 1% of the federal budget. So for every dollar you pay in federal taxes, one cent of that goes to the State Department. So if you want to give me a penny at the end of this presentation, I will, I will happily accept it. Okay, the U.S. Foreign Service. Of those 76,000 people who work for the State Department, 13,000 of us are Foreign Service officers. And I mentioned earlier that I'm a Foreign Service generalist. I'm an FSO generalist. So it's important to distinguish between a generalist and a specialist because the Foreign Service has both. 
the specialists, well, it's exactly what you might expect is they, they're very specialized. These are highly technical support administrative services. So for instance, we have like IT professionals that work in our embassies and consulates around the world. You can't really learn that on the job. You, you have to know that before you go into it. Similar with uh, medical professionals, doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners who work for the department. You can't learn how to be a doctor on the job. Like you really have to have gone to medical school. You have to know your stuff before you get that job. And so if you're an FSO specialist, you have that very specific background and you do that specific job wherever you go. You're always doing that same job or a version of that same job wherever you go. Then there's the rest of us who are generalists. A lot of the things you might traditionally think of when it comes to diplomacy or embassies are things that generalists do. So we're hired to perform a really wide array of tasks within five broadly defined career cones. And this generalist philosophy, basically, the reason that we do this is because the United States is a huge country, very powerful country. We have interests and things we care about all over the world. And it would be incredibly difficult to recruit and maintain experts in every country or every issue imaginable that are willing to move around the world every two to three years for the course of a 30 year career. It's really, really hard to hire and maintain a workforce like that. And so with the generalist philosophy, what they want to do is make sure that you have people that are flexible, that are adaptable, that you can drop them into one country. And if you are at a job that is in your rank, you should be able to do it. So the upside is we're supposed to be very, very flexible and we can, we can land on our feet wherever we're dropped. That's the upside. The downside is when we enter a new job, we often aren't experts in the country we're going to. Um, we have to learn a lot of it on the job. So there's upsides and downsides, but that's the way that the, the State Department has approached it over the course of the history of the Foreign Service. So I mentioned that Foreign Service generalists have five career cones. I don't know why we call them cones, but we do. Uh, everyone has to choose a cone when you become a Foreign Service officer. Uh, so I'll quickly touch on the five cones. You've got the consular work, which is visas and passports and it's American citizen services. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes bad things happen to good Americans overseas and sometimes bad things happen to Americans who make poor decisions overseas and we're there because we are. The, the, there's no responsibility more important to the State Department than helping U.S. citizens overseas. Um, it's something that we are there to do. And so a lot of our work, kind of a, uh, one of the most important things we do in our largest sections of many of our embassies and consulates is the consular section, not just for visas, for, for, for work and for travel and for immigrants, but also helping American citizens. Uh, it's also very meaningful work to be able to help American citizens. One of my favorite experiences was doing that work in Guatemala. So that's the consular. Uh, you've got political and economic cones as well. Those are maybe the things you might stereotypically think of a, a diplomat doing, is you're reporting on economic issues and trends, on political issues, on who's going to win the election, who are the important decision makers. You're meeting with contacts, not just the elected officials, but within important ministries. You're meeting with people outside of the political process to learn about what's going on. And the whole idea is to learn about the country so we can best represent U.S. values and U.S. interests and, and pursue U.S. values and U.S. interests in the country. And so that way we can also tell the real policy makers and decision makers in Washington, like what's going on? Because there are a lot of countries in the world where, boy, there's a lot of publicly available information. Uh, the internet is a wonder in that way. You can learn a lot about a lot of places, but there really is no substitute to sitting down with a local person who knows their country, who knows their profession, who knows their issue and talking to them and learning about what's really going on. Um, and so that's the real value add that we have at the State Department through the, our political and economic work is being present in countries overseas so we can learn those things to the best degree possible. Next up, we have uh, public diplomacy. Uh, that is divided into a couple of buckets. One bucket is uh, cultural affairs. So that is everything from um, art presentations to dance troops to exchange programs to uh, like the Fulbright program that you may be familiar with. Um, and public events. And then it's things like engaging with the press, social media, putting out information for the public to consume and those sorts of things. And I'm a public diplomacy officer. Most of my tours are within the public diplomacy cone. And lastly, management. Uh, management folks, they manage the largest number of people because their primary role is keeping the embassies and consulates and our buildings up and running and working. It is a massive, massive undertaking to have a, a functioning embassy. It's everything from 
making sure that the heating is working and the cooling is working and the building is safe and that the and that everything is kept clean and that we have cars that we can transport people around. It is an immense undertaking uh, in the management cone. And so that's the other piece of what the Foreign Service journalists do, uh, those five things. So that's kind of the broad strokes. And I wanted to present this idea of a day in the life of an FSO in three different ways. So first, you've got the expected. We see this guy here, he's confident, he's smiling, he knows what he's doing because he expects it and he's an expert. He knows exactly what to do. Then we've got the occasionally expected. Like you, you, you kind of know how to do it. You've seen it before, you've dealt with it before, but it's been a little while. So you have to kind of think about it to, to remember how to do it. And then you've got the unexpected. Now, of course, we hope that people respond with a little bit more poise and grace than Beaker here is responding with, but it is worth underscoring that there are a lot of things that happen overseas when we're in embassies and consulates that we just can't expect. Uh, things come up when they come up and we have to learn how to deal with them. So let me just go through each of these three categories to give you a few examples from my own career in the Foreign Service. So the expected, we see somebody typing there. We do a lot of writing. We write a lot of reports. We write a lot of cables. We write a lot of memos. We write a lot of emails. Expect to write a whole lot if you're a foreign service officer. So writing is a huge part of the job. Below that, uh, you see me in the center of a group of women that is in Warsaw. Those women are from Afghanistan. When I was in uh, Warsaw, the Poles were still with us militarily in Afghanistan and the US government wanted to convince them to continue to support the, the NATO mission in Afghanistan. We organized a speaking tour for five women from Afghanistan. They spoke at a major women's event in uh, Poland. They met with uh, local decision makers, elected officials to share their experiences and their point of view on the situation in Afghanistan. So speaker tours where you're bringing people to speak about an issue of interest to the host country and the US government, that's very expected. That's something we do all the time, particularly in public affairs. You see the word visa there on a visa foil. That's the sticker that goes into a passport with a visa on it. We do visas all the time. That's very expected. As I was mentioning, helping American citizens, that is also expected. That happens all the time. Uh, in the middle, you can see a group of people in a hall and a person giving a presentation in the middle. Uh, that's me in Guatemala about six years ago or so, uh, giving a presentation about worker visas. So that's another thing we do is a lot of public speaking. Um, and public speaking happens not just out of the public affairs uh, cone, but there's a lot of public speaking. If you're a consular and you're giving presentations on visas, for instance, or tourism issues, if you're a political or economic officer, you may be giving speeches on those issues. So public speaking is a huge part of uh, the, the foreign service as well. And you, there's another picture up there in the corner of me uh, on a radio program in Warsaw during my time in Poland. Um, we talk to the press a lot. Um, we have spokespeople at embassies. And one of the big things we do is try to build relationships with journalists. So when they want to write about the United States, not that we say like, here's what you must write, but we want to have relationships with journalists so we can present our point of view and then they can write however they, they wish to write. So that's another big thing that we do. Next to that, you see a sort of monument, some flowers around it. So on 9-11, there were six Polish citizens who were killed in those attacks. And when I was in Poland, the 10th year anniversary of 9-11 took place. And so we organized an event with a local government, the local kind of alder or region in the city of Warsaw to commemorate the six Poles who died during 9-11. There was a park, there is a park with their, their names on a plaque. And so we did a large public event our ambassador spoke at it, the Polish foreign minister, the mayor of Warsaw, other very important elected officials in Poland spoke at this event. And so one thing that we do that's very expected is commemorative events, particularly events that are important to both the host country and us as the U.S. government. And commemorating the 9-11 attacks where obviously U.S. citizens and Polish citizens both died is something that is very meaningful to, to both countries. So that is something that we do on a regular basis in missions around the world. And lastly, you see a couple of gentlemen shaking hands. That can be negotiating a deal. That can be just meeting and sharing information. And that's what we do a lot of the time is where we do negotiations and we meet contacts and we have conversations. So these are the kind of things where lots uh, is very expected. Uh, these are the kind of things that we do all the time. Then you've got the occasionally expected. You know these are gonna happen, but they don't happen every day. 
So there's a picture of me there with Joe Biden when he was vice president during the Obama administration. He came down to Guatemala for a visit. Uh, I didn't have a very large role in that visit. I had a small role, but he came and did an event with the embassy uh, during that time as well. Lower on the screen, you'll see a picture of uh, Secretary Pompeo, then Secretary Pompeo with the president of Suriname and the foreign minister of Suriname. That was an event that took place when I was in Suriname. I had a very heavy role in helping to organize that visit. And the occasionally expected in this circumstance is visits from the president, the vice president, the secretary. It is a big deal uh, when a president, a vice president or secretary goes overseas and visits the country. And it is a tremendous amount of work. Uh, it is uh, almost 24 seven around the clock work uh, prior to uh, the, the visit from a principal like that. And you can get a lot done. Uh, and it is very important to host countries. It's people like to have good relationships. Most countries like to have good relationships with the United States. And so a lot can be done during those, those meetings and a lot can come out of those kind of visits. So that's a big thing we do. So we occasionally expect that to happen. Above, you'll see a, a big statue of uh, former President Reagan. Uh, so President Reagan was very popular in Poland, particularly among people who remember the communist era in the 1980s. And during his, uh, the centennial of his birth in 2011, there was a group of Poles who raised money to build a statue of former President Reagan uh, in a park right across the street from the U.S. Embassy. And mo many of the people in that picture there are U.S. members of Congress. So yes, we do visits for executive branch officials, but we also do visits for members of Congress who travel around the world to learn about what's going on in given countries. So we, we do that with, uh, and most, most we call those congressional delegations. Most of them are bipartisan. Uh, it's extremely rare, although it happens that there will be a congressional visit with just one party. Uh, generally, they like to travel with, with some, some proportion of both Democrats and Republicans to make sure that it is, they are presenting a, we are the American people face to the world. But uh, organizing congressional visits is also something that happens pretty, pretty regularly, but not every day. Then there's a picture of myself and some colleagues. Uh, we were on a service trip in Guatemala putting together clean cook stoves. We do those kind of events every, every so often, particularly in countries where there is a USAID presence that are doing uh, uh, aid and development programs. And then in the bottom corner, uh, you see a, an event, which is a 4th of July event. Um, most countries around the world, we all make a big deal of our respective national days, and we host big events where we invite other diplomats from the diplomatic corps, as well as host government officials, people who are influential in, in business and media, et cetera, to a big celebration. Um, it's also a good chance to be able to meet a lot of people and talk to a lot of people in one small place. So it's a large, it, it is a party. It's also an opportunity to see people that you may not often get to see and get people together in one place. So that is a big thing that we do. And we, we know when that's gonna happen. It's gonna happen on July 4th every year. So we can at least put that one on the calendar. Lastly here, a few examples of the unexpected. So the gentleman with the Surinamese flag in the background is the former vice president of Suriname. Uh, he announced Suriname's closure of its airspace during the COVID pandemic. Not shocking, but the exact timing was unexpected, particularly to the 200 or so U.S. citizens who didn't know about it and suddenly found themselves stranded and didn't know how they were going to get home. That also happened to include a group of some 30 or 40 students uh, from a school in Tennessee, and their families wanted to know what was going on. We got calls, the State Department got calls from both senators from Tennessee. I personally got a call from a member of Congress wanting to know what's going on. No one was, no one was angry, no one was yelling at us, but it was not expected that airspace was going to be shut like that. So we have to be ready to provide support to those American citizens, to communicate with families back home, and to communicate with their elected representatives, because the representatives are there to make sure that the U.S. government is supporting their constituents. So that's the kind of unexpected thing that, that came up while I was in Suriname. Next to him, uh, if anyone reads Polish, that's great. Um, if not, so that is an example. So what that says is the po Polish foreign minister closes the Polish embassy in Damascus. Now, why do we care about that? Well, uh, oftentimes if the U.S. has a mission somewhere and leaves a country, we'll have a protecting power. And the protecting power kind of takes care, keeps an eye on our stuff and helps our citizens since we're not there. When the civil war began in uh, Syria approximately 10, 11 years ago, uh, the US embassy closed relatively early and Poland became our protecting power. But eventually things continued to deteriorate and eventually Poland decided that they were gonna leave as well. 
they were going to close their embassy, which means that we were no longer going to have them as a protecting power. We had a few hours of a heads up that this was going to happen. So we have to figure out how do we publicly discuss this? What are we going to do for our protecting power? How do we thank the Poles for taking that responsibility uh, for, for a number of months at that time? And you don't have a lot of time. You get the, the heads up if you're lucky from the host government, and then you have to be able to put your policy into place, figure out what to do, figure out how to talk about it publicly. So that's another example of the unexpected. Below that, there was an attack in uh, Dhaka a few, five years ago. Uh, in, a, in Bangladesh, where a lot of diplomats uh, spend time. And that happened while I was in the press office in Washington. And so we had to be ready to talk about that in real time as it was going on. Again, that's something that's unexpected. These, it's the kind of thing that you might expect that a, that a terrorist attack will happen somewhere in the world, but you obviously you can't know when exactly. So you have to be ready to respond wherever and however it happens. And lastly, um, this is an image that we're seeing similar images of these today. Uh, we also saw similar Im images in 2014 when I was in Guatemala of unaccompanied minors at the US border. Uh, when I was in 2014, uh, that was a particular issue in that year. And I happened to be giving a doing a tour around Guatemala speaking about worker visas. And so I had to be ready to discuss that issue to answer questions about it if the local press asked. And so these are the kind of things that are that are unexpected that don't happen every day but that you do have to learn to deal with and do come to occupy a large part of our time overseas as American diplomats. Now, so with that, I have talked for a good chunk of time now, and I would be happy to hand it over to answer some questions and have some conversation. Thank you, Frankie. This was really very nice. Um, do you, let's, um, let's stop sharing for the moment just so we can view everybody in a, in a gallery of guests. Um, and then um, I'm gonna start with the first question because, you know, because I get to. <laughs> um, for, for those of us who are, you know, I mean, we know what the Foreign Service is, but not necessarily all the ins and outs. I can imagine that some of your posts have been more enjoyable than others. Which of the posts that you've had so far um, going backwards, you've got Suriname, Poland, Guatemala. Well, I suppose you could count Washington, D.C. It's kind of like a foreign nation. But which of those posts was most meaningful to you? So it's hard to say. In some ways, it's almost like, though, like which, which child is your favorite child? Um, because I, I did, I enjoyed all of my tours. Uh, I was very happy to go into all of them. I was also very happy to leave at the end. That's one of the good things about the Foreign Service as a career is if you have a kind of an in, innate wanderlust, it's a, it's a good place to have a career, and I definitely have that. Um, there are uh, a couple of the more rewarding times, as I had mentioned, doing American citizen services in Guatemala. Um, that was very meaningful to be able to help American citizens. So, uh, for instance, there was a, a gentleman who was a, a veteran of the first Gulf War, and he had mental issues, and he ended up in this really, really not very nice um, uh, mental facility. And I was able to work with him and work with his family and work with the VA in the United States to get him back home. And being able to help American citizens is incredibly rewarding. And if there's any reason that we have embassies and concerts abroad, it's that. Um, and then the, the other thing in, that I had mentioned earlier is our relationship with Suriname is Suriname elects a new government that wants to deepen its relationship with the United States. That was a fascinating experience and an awesome experience. Um, you, you, I joined the Foreign Service for moments like that, where you are, you have, you're trying to, to, to build and deepen a relationship. You're identifying where can we work together? How can we work together? What programs do we have that can be useful for you? What do you have that can be helpful to the United States? What were our mutual interests? But also at the same time, where do we diverge? Uh, where do we have slightly different opinion? Where are the things that we, just, we know aren't, we're not going to make any progress on uh, and figuring out which, you know, which, which items fall in which of those categories. And so from a point of view of kind of rebuilding and developing and honing a relationship uh, overseas, that was, that was probably my favorite experience. Okay. Well, that leads us into one of the questions from the chat. Barb Drake asks, <clears throat> excuse me, what's the purpose of, um, moving every two to three years. Why is that a, is that a benefit or is that a hindrance? What do you think about the need to rotate? 
Yeah, so there definitely is a need to rotate. Um, the longer you spend in a country, the more you start to empathize with its interests rather than US interests. So having a rotation definitely makes sense. That said, most countries, their diplomatic corps usually spend more than two or three years. Uh, some of them can be up to like 10 years. They can have very long tours. Um, personally, I think our tours should be a little bit longer. Um, I think part of the reason our tours are a little shorter is because we have so many missions around the world and we need to, we need to move people from one to the other. There are, as you might imagine, there are some places in the world that are very popular that people really want to go to, and then there are other places that are not as popular. And so part of the way that you make sure that everywhere is always staffed is you have a kind of consistent cycle every two or three years of people shifting from one mission to another. Um, but, you know, if I, were, if I were in charge for a day, I would prefer to have slightly longer tours. I think it's, um, it's helpful to spend more time in a country to really get to know it. Um, in, in my experience, usually about six to 12 months in is when I start to feel like, now I got it. Now I have a sense of what's going on. Now I think I can be effective. And it'd be nice to, to have that experience over the course of the first year and then have another two, three, four years to kind of uh, harness that newly hatched expertise. But you have a great deal of, of uh, skill, obviously. Um, Joni points out that it's difficult to get into career foreign service. Um, the, the entrance exam is just a part of it. Um, it. She asks, pointedly, does the applicant pool generally skew along candidates from Ivy League schools? out of the Foreign Service Corps, how many females to males? What's the ratio? I don't know the male to female ratio off the top of my head. Um, it's closer to 50-50. It's closer to, to parity than the uh, racial composition of the Foreign Service. That, that, that is for sure. But I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Um, a lot, of, there are plenty of people in the Foreign Service who have not gone to Ivy League schools. Um, and one of the nice things about the Foreign Service is that even though the exam is, is difficult to pass, anyone can take it. Um, now, there are questions about how the department goes about recruiting, who do we encourage to apply, who do we encourage to take the test. I don't have a lot of visibility over how, how the department's recruitment strategy, and I can't even remember how I first learned about the Foreign Service. At some point when I was in college, I learned about it. Um, but if you are a U.S. citizen and you have a high school degree, you can apply for the Foreign Service. And so... In theory, you don't have to even have a college degree. Now that said, I've never met a foreign service officer who doesn't, but when I started, you start with an orientation class and there were about 90 of us in my orientation class. Uh, I was 27, 28 years old. Uh, so this was you know, early part of my career, but there were other folks who they were, uh, this was a second or third career, people who were in their like uh, 40s or 50s, some quite close to 60. Uh, and there were people from all sorts of different backgrounds in terms of where they went to, to college. So. There used to be this saying about the Foreign Service and the State Department being male, pale, and Yale. Um, and so there's, there's, there definitely was truth to that, and there is some truth to that now. Um, that said, what I guess it is a really nice thing that anybody can apply to the Foreign Service. Okay. What uh, recommendations would you make to students for courses of study? What, what of your uh, educational background came, became the most useful to you, either taking the exam or in your various placements? Uh, a couple of things. The, the, the main thing is just having a very broad knowledge about U.S. history, politics, culture. So the service exam itself is kind of like a, a glorified trivial pursuit experience with, and that's because they're looking for generalists. So this is, they want people that, they, that can like land on their feet anywhere. So they want to be able to pluck people that they, they know a good amount right off the bat about politics, economics, history culture. And so they really test for that. Um, and so, you know, I think that like, if you're almost, if you're, if you're a high school student and you just did really well on the AP U.S. history exam, you're probably in a perfect position to apply for the foreign service. When I was studying to, to take the foreign service exam, there are a lot of questions like, um, Tippi Kattun Tyler too. Like I knew what that was at one point, but I didn't remember at that time because it had been many years since high school at that point. Um, and so having a broad knowledge base about U.S. history, culture, politics, economics, so that's really, really important for the, the test process. Okay. The other thing that's important, because there um, there's a part of the test that is an oral assessment, 
uh, where you have to work in a group or you have to think on your feet. And then once you're overseas and you certainly have to do a lot of thinking on your feet, the thing that's important is putting yourself in an uncomfortable circumstance in some way, shape or form and seeing how you do with that. That could be study abroad, that could be a job, that can be any number of things. But if you're going to be successful in the foreign service, you will find yourself in a position where you don't know what's going on, where you don't know what to do, where there is no playbook and you have to figure something out. So it's very, very helpful to have gone through that in some way, shape or form prior to being in the foreign service or even prior to taking the exam. Okay, good. Shelley asks about the differences in how people in the countries around the world view the United States under various administrations. You know, when you go from Obama to Trump to Biden, um, how does the perception of the United States change or does it? It depends a lot on who you're talking to. Um, so if you are talking to, um, if you're talking to the host, to the government itself, they generally, they understand that the United States government is the United States government is the United States government. And so they may have preference for one administration or another, but in most places they're going to, you know, if they don't like the new guy, they'll grit their teeth. If they're excited about the new guy, they may show a little bit more enthusiasm. Um, but they definitely maintain they, it's the US people have spoken, the US people get to elect their leaders. And so they, they respect that. Uh, things may be a little bit different in circumstances where um, if there's a, a current administration that has a big project uh, or as a, a policy that is really, really favorable in a particular country that that country likes and the new administration comes in and is not as thrilled with that policy and wants to change it, then it can be, then it can be a little bit different. Um, and then it comes to when you're talking about outside of the government, you know, people have their individual opinions. Um, and sometimes people are very opinionated about what they think. And sometimes they're more diplomatic about what they think. Um, and it also depends on like, what is their, their interest? I mean, maybe, uh, you know, I think like the, the, the Trump administration looked very, very positively on uh, looking for a kind of oil opportunities and fossil fuel opportunities around the world, probably less so than the Biden administration. So countries that are trying to be active in that field may have liked the opportunity to work with the previous administration, maybe a little bit more than the current one. Then again, on the other hand, um, a lot of countries around the world want to work with the United States on climate change, which is not a priority under the previous administration, and it is a priority under the current one. So it depends partially on the person's role and it depends on the issue. Um, but yeah, at the government to government level, you know, generally it's the same for us when another country, when they have new leaders come in, we recognize that those are the leaders of the country. Those are the democratically elected leaders in cases where it's a democratic country, of course. Um, and so we have to respect that. Okay. Um, Mary asks, a number of years ago, a State Department employee on the anti-terrorism desk told us that the State Department foiled over 300 plots against the United States citizens or interests overseas annually. Is this still the case? Do you have any information about that? I do not have any information on that, I'm afraid. A lot of what the State Department does, though, is not necessarily publicized all the time, correct? That's right, yeah, yeah. And a lot of kind of things when it comes to you know, in intelligence matters or when it comes to anything that might touch on the uh, a U.S. citizen because of the Privacy Act, which we take very, very seriously. Um, we are loath to talk about it publicly. We do not talk about it publicly because legally we, we can't. And so sometimes it's a, a matter of intelligence and sometimes it's a matter of an American citizen is involved and they have a right to privacy. Okay. One of our students, Marjolies, asks, what kind of benefits does the Foreign Service career provide? So a lot of benefits. Um, so I'll start with just the, 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 the pay scale. But the pay is quite good. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy with the salary. Uh, so that's a very nice thing. A real perk is that when we're overseas, we don't have to pay for our housing because embassies provide either they rent places or they own places and they maintain them and that's where we live. And the idea behind that is if they made us pay for our own housing, you can't really also have housing in the U.S. on a middle-class salary. You can't you can't pay for a house overseas and change it every two or three years and have a house in the U.S. So that's the idea. And so what that means is you actually are able to save a lot of money. Um, if and I paid off my student loans very quickly. I was able to uh, save up money and purchase a condo in Washington relatively quickly. So financially, I think it's a pretty good it's a pretty good deal. Um, if you like moving around the world on a regular basis, it's also a very very good deal. 
Um, yeah, so we said it's every two or three years, you're going to a different country. So, so, so that's terrific. If that's something that you like to do, you can build it right into your career. Um, it is, uh, if we say healthcare comes with it, that's great. It's quite friendly towards families. Um, they, they really try to do everything they can to be family friendly. Um, when I have a one-year-old, when my son was born a lot, uh, two years ago, he, I was able to take off almost three months, um, kind of no questions asked, and uh, to take care of him and be with my wife. And so that was great. Uh, so, and overall, I've been very happy with the department uh, as, a, as, a, as my employer. So those are the, yeah, those are, those are among the, the benefits to the job. And the, the job itself is just, it's fascinating. Um, you get to do a lot of really cool things. You meet a lot of really cool people. And one nice thing is, there, there's no job in the world that doesn't have downsides. There's no job in the world that doesn't have things that you have to just grit your teeth and get through. Like, like everybody has to deal with that. One of the perks in the foreign service is that when you leave a mission, when you leave an, an overseas assignment, you're done. Like you get to go home on home leave for a month or two and you forget about it all. There's nothing like, oh, I have to get back to so-and-so or I have to deal with that after vacation. Like, no, like you, <laughs> you, you are done until you move to your next assignment. So a lot of perks to being in the foreign service. And uh, one, another one I would add, if you like learning languages, um, it's also a good place because they will often give you language training before going to an overseas assignment where you need to use that language. So if you want to learn languages, like to learn languages, uh, I've probably spent one year, literally one year of my 11 years in language class uh, as a foreign service officer. So if you like languages, it's a good space. How many languages would you say that you can operate in? Uh, so my Spanish is good. Uh, my French is rusty, but okay. And, um, my Polish and my Dutch are, are, are long receded into the darker parts of my memory. Although I, I'm sure I could dig them up if need be. Are you going to learn one of the Indian languages, Hindi or something? I'm not. I'm going to a part of India where it is, uh, I think the prominent language is Telugu. Um, yeah. And it is not, I mean, widely spoken anywhere else. And so they have us just do English there, which my, okay. my brain is a little tired of languages at this point. So I'm happy for that. <laughs> Very good. Um, Marjorie did a follow-up. Where can she find practice tests or practice courses to prepare for the foreign service exam? So there is a, uh, I think it's careers.state.gov has a lot of information about careers in the foreign service and the state department. So I'm not sure if they have re references or materials on that website. That's a good place to look. Um, I just remember I, I Googled it um, at the time is looking for Googling uh, practice foreign service test or old foreign service test, former foreign service test, something like that. Um, and they're, they're generally out there if you, if you look at it, at the, uh, if you do some, some Googling for a little while. Um, and that'd be, yeah, that'd be the, the best way to do that. Okay. And then outside of college, what kinds of programs or experiences do you think would be most beneficial to a person uh, who, who wants to seek a foreign service job? So living and working in over overseas is a big one. I, I taught English in France for two years after college, and I tremendously enjoyed the experience. Um, I learned, I, at the time, I suspected that I, I would like living abroad. I would like being abroad. I would like learning a language. And but you don't really know until you try it. And so I went and I tried it and it turned out that yes, I, I did like that. Uh, and it was a fascinating and really rewarding experience. And so being abroad, working abroad is a good way to learn whether or not you want to work and live abroad. Um, and similar to that, one of the items I touched on earlier is putting yourself in kind of like new or novel or uncomfortable situations, not from like a safety, not, not to make a stupid decisions, right? But put yourself in a place where it's not, it's not where you grow up. It's not the familiar thing. It's not something you already know how to do, but it's something that's challenging where you have to think on your feet, where you have to develop no skills. And you, you'll, you'll find, or in some case, you'll find reserves in yourself to do it. Or you might find like, you know what, this isn't for me. And that's also the right answer if that turns out to be the answer. Um, but I think it is very, very valuable to figure out a way to be in a situation where you are, you are learning something completely new and having to think on your feet on a regular basis. So, um, you know, living and working abroad kind of naturally offers that uh, experience, but you can also acquire that in any number of ways here in the United States. Um, and so I would certainly recommend a thing like that as well. And um, another thing worth mentioning on, uh, you know, experiences, 
before trying to get into the foreign service is that it's a long process. Um, I took the written exam and by the time I passed everything and was offered a slot, about 13 months had passed because um, they have to do a security background check. And that was at a time when they were expanding the foreign service and they had more background investigators to do that kind of work. So it takes a little while, which means it's the kind of thing that you can apply for while you're living your life, while you're doing something else, whether that's a job, whether that's you're studying, whether that's whatever it happens to be. Um, and so that's, that's also a nice thing is you don't have to um, like make, you don't have to decide right now, right? Like you can do other things and keep it as a, a back burner thought uh, or apply now and then continue to, to, to live your life and do what you're doing, you know, between then and decision time. In the last few years, there has been kind of a, a ebb of the number of people who have been hired by the State Department. Um, and so there have been folks who passed the exam, went through the process, and were in the process of all the, the background checks, checks, et cetera. And is there a time limit? If you don't get posted within X amount of time, um, you have to kind of start over? Yeah, that's right. Um, I think it's maybe a year and a half or so. Okay. approximately. I don't remember exactly off the top of my head. So what happens is if you pass everything, uh, you go onto a list. And assuming you also pass the security background check, then you are eligible to be hired. And so let's say there's a new class of foreign service officers and there are 80 spots. Well, if you're number 81 on the list, because you pass with a score, number 81, you're not getting invited in. Uh, even though you may have just barely had a slightly worse score than number 80, number 80 is getting in that round and you're not. And then the list re is redone based on the scores. And so that person who was 81 the last time, maybe they'll be 74 the next time. It just depends. Now, most, I would say, I think most people who get on the list eventually are invited in, but not everybody. Um, the department goes in, in cycles in terms of, of hiring. And so when I started at a time, so it was the beginning of the Obama administration, Hillary Clinton was secretary, and they decided at that time to expand the foreign service uh, by around 25%. And so it was a, it was a good moment to apply. Um, and there are other moments since then um, where they just haven't been hiring as many people. And so it kind of just depends on the ebb and flow of whether or not they're looking to hire people. Um, I don't have a lot of kind of uh, insider visibility on, on what the hiring cycles will look like in the, the near future, but you know, the baby boomer generation is retiring, um, and that's a big part of the U.S. population and a big part of our workforce, too. And so, and then also in the Foreign Service, most people are required to retire at age 65. And so um, there will be a need to replace people and bring new bodies and new officers in. And so there always will be a need. It's just depending on a particular moment in time of how many. Yeah, we actually, we heard from Ambassador Mark Grossman a couple months ago, uh -huh. and his belief is that we will be hiring um, a lot of State Department personnel in under this administration. So um, for those of you students out there looking, get started. <laughs> so, um, Charles Bush asks, what is the U.S. military presence at U.S. embassies and how does it vary based on our relationship with foreign, with that particular foreign country? How do the numbers compare to the foreign service officers in embassies? It depends very much on the embassy. Um, I'm thinking, so all of the countries I've served in have had some sort of U.S. military presence um, and Suriname was very small. Uh, in Poland, it was quite a bit bigger and Guatemala was quite a bit bigger. Uh, it depends a lot on the nature of the relationship. So I'm just thinking of uh, the Guatemala example and the Poland example. Um, there are very, a lot of what our military colleagues will do is, a lot of it is training oriented in, in Guatemala. Whereas in Poland, a lot of it was like uh, joint operations and a big chunk of it was selling US equipment to the Polish military. Um, which is a big part of, of what we do. And that's also a big uh, government process that has to go through a lot of licensings and approvals. And so it also depends on really what the, what the nature of the relationship with a country is. Um, is it something where we are looking to help a country develop its military? Is it, is it a country where we're looking to have our militaries work together for some particular mission? Um, and yeah, and that will also, that will change exactly what we do and the number of people that, that go in to do it. So it can vary widely. Um, but yeah, in my, in my tours overseas, there has been some kind of military presence 
uh, within our embassy at all of them. And that also, you know, the host government has a say, right? Like if they don't want that, they can say, you know, no, thank you, please. Um, but oftentimes in many places, countries want to work with the United States, um, even in countries where sometimes we have a little bit frosty relations. So the, the, the government that was in Suriname when I arrived there, the man who was the president at the time, although he was democratically elected at that time, he had been um, uh, convicted in absentia on drug charges in the Netherlands. He had been convicted of murder by a, by a, a domestic court. And, so, and his son is in US prison for on drugs and weapon charges. So as you might naturally conclude, that could be put a little bit of distance between the relationship with the United States. But we still had cordial relations. We still had, you know, we still had our embassy. We had, you know, they had their embassy in Washington. Um, and we figured out where we could work together. Um, so it's not as though, even in places where the relationship isn't great, it can still be functional. So that's a long way of saying that, uh, yes, in, in, in lots of embassies and consulates, we have a military presence of, of some way, shape or form that's really tailored to what our national interest is that coincides with that country's national interest. Okay, and Wes asks, would you care to comment on career people working under political appointees? There's a different, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or, origin of the yep. ambassadors, for example. So political versus um, career ambassadors. What do you think? Yeah. Um, so approximately one third or so of U.S. ambassadors are, are political ambassadors versus career ambassadors. Which is, what that means is they're not career foreign service officers or career State Department people. Oftentimes, they are people who raised a bunch of money for the presidential campaign during of the winning candidate. Um, sometimes they are political appointees who they may not be a career state department person, but they have government experience. Um, now, there are also a lot of jobs in Washington, kind of policy making, decision making jobs that are political appointees. Um, and so there's, there's, there's good and bad to it, as, as with all things in life. Um, it is good and important to have political leadership because the department should be responsive to the person who was elected by the American people, who's the president of the United States. Um, like, it's not our job to tell the American people to, you know, to eat their spinach or eat their vegetables, right? Like, we, we need to be responsive. And one way you do that is making sure that the, at the highest echelons, you have people that are politically accountable to the president. So that's very important. And another thing that's really important is if you are a career people in any job, in any place, like the longer you stay in one place, the more you identify with, well, this is how we did it yesterday. So that's how we're going to do it today. And that's how we're going to do it tomorrow. We can just all get kind of naturally a little bit, you know, crotchety and think that, uh, you know, I know best because I've been here for so and so many years. Um, and that's just not always true. Sometimes having a fresh perspective is really, really important to breaking out of bad thinking or bad habits. So those are the really good reasons to have uh, political appointees, and I wouldn't want to get rid of them. Um, the downside, particularly in cases where you're talking about someone who just raised a bunch of money for a presidential candidate, is they often, it's not just that they don't know a lot about the department or know a lot about how an embassy works, is that they're not always invested in the institution. Um, or they don't necessarily, like, they're there to do their two or three years as an ambassador somewhere, um, and then they'll go off to do something else. And I can tell you that from, from my experience working for political appointees as well as career people, um, it really doesn't matter so long as if you feel like the ambassador and the deputy chief of mission, who's the person under the ambassador, if you feel that like they've got your back and they're trying to do the right thing, um, then it's a good working environment. If you feel like um, and they don't particularly care about you or care about the institution or care about the future of you know, the relationship with the host government country, then it's not all that pleasant. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's pros and cons. Um, I, I would prefer to have, I'm not against having people serve as ambassadors or in positions in the State Department that aren't career people. Um, I certainly would prefer that they have expertise or background in the issues uh, at hand. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. That segues into Don's question about um, the past administration using um, the use of state persons of Department of State personnel was not as valued as perhaps in previous administrations, and morale took a hit because of it. Uh, do you think that will change under this administration, or 
what's a good advice to any administration for how they deal with their foreign service corps? Yeah, I think uh, it's important to show up and demonstrate that you care about your workforce. Um, it's fine to challenge your workforce. It's fine to ask for people to work hard. It's fine to try to shake things up and do things differently. It's also important to let people know that they're, they're valued and that their work matters and that they have expertise that the policymakers and elected officials could benefit from learning from. And so uh, just as an example, shortly after being elected, but before being inaugurated, um, so pres then President-elect Biden uh, recorded this video. It's about three minutes long. Uh, and it was a video for federal employees talking about how much he values what we do, how we're the backbone of the U.S. government's, you know, efforts to do this, that, and the other overseas and at home. And it's very nice to hear that. Um, certainly in a circumstance where, you know, we're overseas most of the time, we're far from family, we're far from friends. It's very, very helpful to hear the president, hear the secretary of state, to have them show up and say things like that. Um, and the and President Biden delivered a speech at the State Department uh, one or two months after being inaugurated, and that's that's a good and right thing. Uh, and I, you know, I would note too that it's not. I certainly understand that different presidents and different parties are going to have different priorities, and that's fine. And I also understand that there will be policies that presidents want to pursue that I don't agree with, and they're elected, and I'm not, so that's fine too. But it actually isn't that hard to to show up and say, I value you, what you do is important, thank you for doing it. Um, now let's figure out how we can do it a little bit better. Very good, thank you. And then um, Joni asks one more question about the in-country personnel that are hired at U.S. embassies around the world. Will the State Department ever hire Russians at any level? Um, uh, or, or are there other expats or paths, I suppose they would be, um, in countries that we won't hire? Um, well, there, were there would certainly be individuals that wouldn't be hired. And, you know, we have to, you know, do some kind of check on the different people that we hire as well. Um, in some countries, you have to be more careful than in other countries. Um, and then in some countries, you know, you have to be worried about the, if the host government doesn't like us very much, um, those employees are at a, a little bit, of, are in a little bit of a dangerous situation or a risky situation. Um, and so, there isn't like a blanket. We don't hire local employees in any given country, but you know, depending on the country, depending on the nature of our relationship, we have to be more, you know, more careful with who we're hiring and what kind of you know information and responsibilities that we entrust them with. Um, and that is a you know the, the thing that is important to emphasize is in any country, while the local workforce is a huge part of what we do, and we really couldn't do our jobs without their their knowledge and their expertise. Um, they are not the decision makers. Um, the, you know, they don't get to sign their name on the dotted line. Um, that's my job, or that's the deputy chief of mission's job, or my boss's job, or the ambassador. That's an American officer's job who has gone through the test and has a security clearance and all that. Um, and so um, that's kind of the, the balancing act between the responsibility um, that we have to the American people and the taxpayer, uh, and also the necessity of getting good information that we can't always have in our own heads. I would add to that, that if there's a country that we cannot hire their personnel to be in our embassy, we probably don't have an embassy there, like perhaps North Korea or Iran, for example. Would that be a fair statement? Otherwise, we vet the people who do get hired by our embassy, even the women who clean the bathroom. <laughs> There certainly would be a vetting process for anybody anywhere we, anywhere we hire. Well, there's for the same for American citizens, like any to be yeah. vetted to, to, to work for a U.S. federal agency. Okay. Well, I think, um, I think I have asked all the questions from the chat. Um, I, I want to throw out, somebody had asked about the language earlier, but I want to ask, do you find, um, if you are placed in some place that your language is you know, that you're just learning Poland, for example, I'm, I'm guessing you didn't study Polish at IVC High School here in Chillicothe. Um, do you find a disadvantage for American diplomats abroad who don't speak the local language? It depends on the specific job. There are some jobs where it's extremely important to speak the language, at least to a functional level. 
So if you're doing visa interviews in a country where a few people speak English, at a minimum, you have to know how to do a good visa interview and ask the right questions and understand their answers uh, in, the, in whatever the language is. There are other jobs where it is less important. So um, if you are doing a political or an economic job, so you're reporting on political economic trends in a, in a European country, particularly Western European country, you're interacting with the government, you're interacting with business officials, those folks all speak excellent English and they've been speaking English for probably their whole lives. Um, it's highly unlikely that you will be able to speak Lithuanian as well as the Lithuanian foreign minister speaks English. Um, it's just probably not going to happen. Um, but there are other jobs, like when I was doing public affairs in Poland, even though kind of the Polish government business elite has a very high level of English, that's not always the case like outside of the capital. Um, and so I did a lot of public speaking and I did a lot of media where I was speaking Polish and I was able to develop a pretty good level of it. And so that was extremely helpful for the tour. Um, but I, yeah, I also, you know, was able to, like I had, a, I had a lot of Polish training before going there. I think some jobs, yeah, it really depends. There, there are jobs where it's extremely important and there are jobs where it's quite not as important. Um, it is helpful to, to come in knowing a language or two, um, but I came in with a high level of French, but I've never had the opportunity to use it just the way that the, the, the assignments process shakes out. I've never had that opportunity. So um, it just kind of, it's a, it's a position by position kind of thing. But if you have studied a language, um, you can, you have the ability to add additional languages. So um, I would make that argument. So your, your brain yeah. is wired to learn the language. So any language, might help you um, at least get into the groove of being able to learn more languages depending on where you're posted. So, right, right, yeah, I agree. So I just put a note in the chat um, that we're going to, going to officially close this um, okay. because it is noon. But if anybody wants to stay around, do you have a few more minutes, Frankie? You want to ask some answer some questions, especially from students or, or I can local folks who want to say hello? Absolutely. All right. Well, I'm, um, and I'll also put a plug in for the Institute of International Studies and the Department of History, Department of Political Science here at Bradley University. We have outstanding programs and a number of our own alums who have worked in foreign service and serve in various embassies around the world. Um, so it's our honor and pleasure to um, have you speak with us this, this Friday, Frankie. And on behalf of the Peoria Area World Affairs Council, thank you very much. Next week, we have a program on the internet, how the internet saved us during the pandemic with Patty Vargas Leon from Tufts University. So um, join us next week for our World Affairs Friday at 11 a.m. Thank you all. And again, if you wish to stay around, you're welcome to.